good to see you here this morning. You might say you don't look like Harold. Harold, thanks you for that, okay? Um, uh, Harold was going to be preaching today and next week. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Kathy uh, ended up going back to the U.S. Hospital and uh, has been there for the better part of this week. And uh, Harold left me a message on Thursday and he says, he says, Tim, I'm supposed to preach, but I think Kathy is going to come home on Saturday. And he thought it would be a good idea if he was there to bring her home. <laughs> and uh, so he asked if I could fill in this morning. And uh, so I sure hope I remember how to do this, okay? <laughs> um, it, is, it is just good to be here with you. Let's go ahead. Uh, take your Bibles. Isaiah chapter 40 is uh, where we want to begin this morning. Um, you know what? God is awesome, isn't he? Uh, and in this day and age where everything is considered awesome, uh, everything else is not, but God is. Okay? Uh, I remember, oh, back several years ago, that word awesome was thrown around this, you know, boy, oh, that dinner was awesome. That was, that was, that was really good. Or, or, man, you did an awesome job. Well, the job that I do, or the food, not the food I cook, dude, my food's not awesome. Okay, I'll admit that. But the food that, that we cook and the jobs that we do are nothing compared to how awesome the God is. We serve a great God, amen? amen? We serve a God who is awesome above all that we could ask or think. Hollywood cannot begin to script, could not begin to formulate a plan that would show us the true awesomeness that God has. And so in Isaiah chapter 40, uh, it talks about the handiwork of God. And so Isaiah chapter 40, we're going to start in verse 21. And I want you to put yourself uh, in this place, okay? As you are hearing this, and remember that whenever we take God's word, God's word spoke to the people then just as it speaks to us today. So let yourself become the audience of God's word as, as you read this. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? In other words, don't you get it? Don't you know? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither, the tempest carries them off like stubble. Verse 25, to whom then will you compare me? Oh, there's a great song. There is none like you. We sing that here every so often, don't we? You know what? Great song, great theology there, taken right out of the thoughts here of Isaiah chapter 40. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these, who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might. And because he is strong in power, not one is missing. The sovereign God of the universe, the God that has created everything, is the same God who not only has created you, but the God that knows you in a more personal way than you even know yourself. I look at this slide up here, and I, I just fell in love with that. I did. Now, I, I don't know a whole lot about space. You know, I watch, I watch Star Wars. <laughs> That's what I know. I like Star Trek, too. I know stars from there. But I look at that. And I, I say to myself, you know what, Tim? God made that. God made me. God made you. We serve just an awesome, awesome God. I'm so thankful that he can make stars like this. I'm thankful that he can make our bodies. And he made them in just a really cool way, didn't he? You know what? Uh, sometimes we can repair ourselves. 
That's kind of a cool thing. Uh, I was talking with Bill right before the service, and he came up to me, he said, well, he said, I finally went to med station. Bill's been kind of sickly for a little bit. He says, I finally went to med station, and he says, guess what? He says, they gave me two days off work. He almost wore, Sam, he wore that like a badge of honor. I got two days off work. Yeah, well, I can't help you there. But he says, he says, you know what? I had two days off work, and I said, well, they probably gave us some antibiotics, something like that, and, and he said, yeah, they did. Um, you know what? The antibiotics did their job. He says he's feeling better than he has in a long time, and we're thankful for that. Aren't you thankful for medications that we can take that help us feel well and actually repair our bodies? When I had a heart attack, the doc told me, he said, you know, uh, you've got some damage here, but he says, don't worry about it. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take care of itself. Uh, Deb, I thought he was nuts. How does a person's heart repair itself? Guess what? It done did. Okay? We are made in an awesome, awesome way. The same God that has made the stars in the heavens has created you and me. The sovereign God of the universe, creator God, he cares for you. Verse 21, it starts out, and I love Isaiah's awareness here of who he is. He says, do you not know? Have you not heard? Now, if my mother talked to me that way, I'd know I was in trouble. Didn't you hear me say this? I'm sure my mom did say that to me more than once. Probably meant to say it to my twin brother. Anyway, do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? Now, news about God's sovereign power, that is not new. It has been evident from the very beginning of time, from the moment that creation began. We see pictures of a sovereign God, a God who is control, in control of everything. God's existence, his power has been evident since the very foundation of the world. When did the very foundation of the world begin? I can tell you, that's an easy answer. And science has been stymied by this for years. They didn't come to me. I could tell them. In the beginning, God. That's when it started. Okay? The very foundations of the world, God's sovereign work, so very evident, uh, is evidenced in that way. He is an awesome creator. God is also the governor of the world. He is the one that, that watches over things. Verse 22 says, It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants are like grasshoppers. So check this out. 2,200 years between then and Christopher Columbus having to prove that the world is round. We knew it all along. It was all right here in Isaiah. He sits above the circle of the earth. God said our planet was circular and was not flat. It was there all along. Something else I look at here, too. You know what? We as people, we don't like being called things, do we? We don't, we don't like all of that sometimes. Guess what? Isaiah just said, we're grasshoppers. Yeah, we're grasshoppers. He says... The inhabitants of the earth. Scott, you're a grasshopper, man. You're a big grasshopper, but you're a grasshopper. Okay. What do we know about grasshoppers? I can remember when I would be out mowing the yard. Boy, they'd feel the vibrations of that lawnmower. And what would they do? They would, the fortunate ones would jump out of the way, wouldn't they? Oh, yeah, and all of a sudden it'd be, you know, I can remember seeing swarms of them. I can, I can remember, I can remember just, oh, it was awful, and especially there in that side yard. And uh, I think the neighbor would get kind of mad. They'd all go over to his yard, and we'd mow over there first. <laughs> we are grasshoppers. If you feel small when you imagine God's creation, if you feel small compared to this, know this. Uh, it's because you are. God says that we are like grasshoppers. Within creation, 
You know, grasshoppers aren't that much of a distraction, are they? You know, at night they make a little sound sometimes and this and that. In overall creation, grasshoppers hardly make a distraction compared to God and his creation. We are called grasshoppers, but you are of infinite value to the God who has created you. You know what? He put his stamp on you from the day you were conceived. That's an awesome God. That is the God that we serve. Verse 22 also says, Who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. This word heaven describes all of God's created universe. In the beginning he said, Now let's make the universe. And there we have it. We are struck by the immense distance of God's creation. I believe the moon is something like 93 million miles away. Is that something like that? It's a huge number. You know, and, and everybody says, oh, it's so far, and this and that. We've sent people to the moon. I've been on trips right around Battle Creek. I think I would have gotten there sooner if I was going to the moon. Um, 93 million miles, we can't, we can't fathom that. You know what? For God, that is nothing. And in our minds, uh, I don't know about you all, I get dizzy thinking about big numbers. I, I just do. I, I can't fathom all of that. And yet here is God, creator of the heavens and the earth, created just out of his very breath. While we can't wrap our minds around that, God certainly, certainly can. The writer of Hebrews understood this. And in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10, it says, You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but listen to this, they will perish, but you remain. They all will become old like a garment, and like a mantle you will roll them up. Like a garment they will also be changed, but you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. You know what? He alone is awesome. He alone is awesome. You know what? Our clothes, they wear out after a while, don't they? What do you do with your clothes when they wear out? You know what? Mine go into the rag bag, and then eventually they're done. Okay? What do you do? You get rid of them, don't you? How about cars? You know what? I am blessed to have uh, a vehicle that gets me from point A to point B. Um, You know what? It's an older vehicle. Praise God for that. It has four wheels, and it runs. And I even have a floor in my van, so it's not like a Flintstone mobile. It gets me where I need to go. I am very, very thankful for that. But you know what the bad thing is about vehicles? Sometimes they just plumb wear out, don't they? And then we're out looking for a new vehicle. Things get old. Things break down. Things are no longer useful. And then we need to go out and replace them. I've had to replace a lot of clothes over the last year. I just have. You know what? I'm okay with that. The old ones got use elsewhere. But I had to replace them. I am thankful. It says right here in Hebrews chapter 1. And it says it several times. It says that God does not change. Are you thankful that God doesn't wear out? God doesn't wear out. You know, aren't you thankful that God doesn't tune out? Okay, watch this. How many of y'all just kind of complain just a little bit sometimes? Just sometimes, just a little bit. Okay, Chris, uh, or Scott, Chris doesn't need help. Yeah, we got it. Yeah. How many of y'all complain sometimes more than just a little bit? Watch this. Ah, we all do, to a certain extent. Aren't you thankful that God doesn't wear out, God doesn't tune out? What does God do? Yeah, sometimes I think God takes the two-by-four across old Tim's head here and says, hey, get with the program. Okay? Trust me. 
okay? I think complaining is indicative of a deeper spiritual problem. That's a whole other message, okay? But I will say this. Uh, when we're focusing on our complaints instead of how awesome God is, we are saying, uh, God, you don't have this. I've got this. Look at what I can do. And I can just see God just sitting back going, oh, my child, okay? Guess what? God is awesome. God doesn't change. God doesn't wear out. God loves you, and he takes care of you. Because of that, God is awesome. His awesomeness knows no bounds, no limits. And I think because of that, there needs to come a point in time. Okay, and James McDonald has wrote a whole book on this, and I absolutely love the book. It's called Being Gripped by the Greatness of God. I think when we read verses like this, and when we read its sections and portions of Scripture throughout God's Word that reminds us of how awesome He is, it should do two things. It should show me how small I am and how big a God I serve. We need to be gripped once again by God's greatness and by how awesome He is. In verses 23 and 24, uh, we see the nothingness of man. And remember the psalmist David, how he wrote, what is man that thou art mindful of him? In other words, God, you're so great. And well, yet here I am. What is man that you would even consider him? That you would even think about him? Verses 23 and 24, it is it is who reduces rulers to nothing, who makes the judges of the earth meaningless. Scarcely have they been planted, scarcely have they been sown. Scarcely has their stock taken root in the earth, but he merely blows on them and they wither and the storm carries them away like stubble. The leaders of the earth, think of this. The leaders of the earth compared to God are nothing. Now, hear me carefully. We need to be in obedience to those that are in authority over us, okay? But realize this. God and his awesomeness, he's the authority. He is the authority. We, unless you all don't know this, let me give you some breaking news. We're in an election season. Maybe you haven't noticed that, okay? Um, you've often heard me say... I, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. Um, on Facebook earlier today, I put up a picture of one of the three stooges. I'm voting for them. Okay? I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but know this. Whoever becomes our president, okay, whoever that is, know that he is our president, but know that he answers to Almighty God. But lest you think that we can use that we answer to Almighty God as well. Okay? But know this. The insignificance of man here compared to God's greatness, it is God who sets up positions of authority. It also says this here. He can reduce the rulers to nothing uh, who makes the judges of the earth meaningless. We serve a great God. Okay? This does not mean we do not obey the authorities that are, that are over us. Rather, what it means is this, is that those who are in positions of authority, they don't answer to themselves. Ultimately, they will answer to an awesome God. They will answer to a great God. And watch this. <laughs> so do you. Okay? We do not escape that. I still answer to Almighty God. And it doesn't mean that whoever is in authority over me goes first. Guess what? We're all going to get our turn. We all answer to Almighty God. But know this, as, as powerful as we think kings and rulers on this earth are, when we look at it in light of Scripture and in light of the sovereignty of God, uh, God is so much over them. It's kind of like when, I'm not sure what those weeds are. I, I don't know weeds, but there's that one. It's kind of like a little puff ball. You know what I'm talking about? Is that what that is? The white, white stuff? Is that dandelion? Okay. Okay. I don't know. 
I never knew that. No, I know milkweed. I got a story about milkweed. We'll do that another time. Okay. But, uh, you know, you would, you would pick this thing and you could blow on it and it just, poof. That's dandelion? Uh, you know what? If it's all over my yard right now, I'll be okay with that. This is February, March. Okay. Um, but imagine taking one of those, blowing it, and it scatters. Okay. To me, what a picture that is. It's just like that. God is an awesome God. Uh, God directs, doesn't he? You know, he is the God who is awesome. And those kings and rulers are like that very seed. Thank you, Judy. That very seed. And they are scattered. God can do that. God can do that. Verses 25 and 26 tell us that even in the midst of God being so awesome and us being so not, and some of us need to hear that, we're not as awesome as we think we are. We are nothing. Verses 25 and 26 tell us that God is in control of it all. God is in control of it all. Verse 25 uh, gives us a comparison. To whom then will you liken me that I should be his equal, says the Holy One. So we start out with the description of the Holy One. Because God is awesome. He's awesome for so many reasons, isn't he? But the first building block to the awesomeness of God does not start with his love or his compassion, but it starts with his holiness. See, he is a holy God. And there have been books written on the subject. There have been messages that have been done. And from all ends of the spectrum, there was a, a book that was written several years ago by a, a prominent <clears throat> theologian, Okay, who said that God is a God of love, so you can do whatever you want, because guess what? Love wins. Love doesn't win, folks. Okay? While God is a God of love, it doesn't start there. It starts with God is a holy God, and there's a reason why we start with his holiness. He is different than you and me, right? He is so different and so above me. If we start out with the premise that God is love and that's all that there is, then there would be no reason for anybody to go to hell. Scripture doesn't teach that. Scripture teaches that we have a choice. That choice is predicated on the fact that God is a holy God. And so the descriptor here says this question, to whom then will you liken me that I should be his equal, says the Holy One, the transcendence of God, it separates him from mankind. That separation is spelled out this way. He did no sin that he might become sin for me. See the difference? I'm a sinner. Am I holy? I am not. And Connie was over here going, no, thank you, you're right, I'm, I'm not. But see, God is. It starts with the holiness of of God and because God is a holy God because it starts there God is in control of things he is in control because of his character his perfection in verse 26 we find that God also controls the stars look at this lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars. Don't you love just looking at the stars? You know, on a clear night, I, I love to go out. And in the quietness of the day, I so, or of the night, I so enjoy just looking up at the stars. And I enjoy just being able to look at God's handiwork and God's scenery. I especially love it when, uh, when um, Maybe you'll hear the crickets, or you'll be out camping, or you'll be, for me it's out fishing, I'll, I'll be out fishing or something at night, and you know what, I am, just, I am just totally struck by the tapestry that God paints 
every night. Lift up your eyes on high. See who has created these stars. It's great to see the stars. It's even better to know and to understand that we worship not the stars, but the one who created them. And the same God who created them created me. The one who leads forth their host by number, he calls them all by name. Because of the greatness of his might, the strength of his power, not one of them is missing. Do you know that, that scientists have not even begun to, to scrape the top, just the littlest bit? of the heavens and of the stars and of what God has created. Night by night, God brings out the star-studded constellations. It says this in Job chapter 38. Uh, people would worship the array of the skies, but yet they would ignore the one who has created them. It says he calls them by name. He calls the stars. He knows their composition. He gives them direction and purpose. With the help of telescopes, we can, we can see so much, can't we? Um, I see pictures like this, and I'll go to NASA's <coughs> website. I love going there. Um, I, I just sit there, and I'm fascinated uh, as I just look at uh, all of these pictures that are coming back from space. Galaxies upon galaxies, clusters of giant stars, it makes the Earth seem so insignificant. And yet, guess what? In what we would consider insignificant, that being the Earth, and you and I are here on this Earth, God says, you are not insignificant. How do we know that? Because God sent his son to die for you. You are not insignificant. In the eternal sphere of things, you matter to God. There will be those that say, we're here. There's a popular song that says, we are nothing but dust in the wind. Oh, I don't like that song. Because God created us with purpose. God created us to praise him, to glorify him, to worship him, to encourage one another. God created us for so many wonderful ways. And there are those that will say that we are just kind of like dust in the wind. We're here for a while, and then we're going to die, and we're going to be done. There was a study done on how much the human body is worth. Okay? And I remember seeing this. It was several years ago, and... I think at that time, if you broke down all of our components, Judy, you are worth $3.87. How's that? Okay, so if somebody gives you five, you have to give them change. No, okay. You are worth infinitely much more to God than $3.87. You are of infinite value to God. Don't ever let anybody tell you that you're just here and gone and you have no purpose. God created you with that very purpose. The same God who created the stars, who created all of these things, is the same God who sent his son. His name was Jesus to come and to redeem you. What was the price? It was of infinite value, wasn't it? It was the very life of his son. We serve an awesome God. We serve a great, great God. You know what? Bigger isn't always better, is it? We look at everything that God has created, and I'm thankful. I, don't get me wrong. I'm thankful for the stars. I'm thankful for the heavens. I'm thankful for what God has created. Sometimes I struggle with the mosquito. Just keeping it real. Sometimes I have a hard time with that one. One o'clock in the morning, that thing buzzing in my ear. I love God's creation. Okay. I get great enjoyment out of God's creation. The same God that made the expanse of the heavens. Such a big thing compared to you and I. If you can understand it, come talk to me later because I don't get it. Okay. But what I do get is this. That is so huge. But Christ died for you. 
God made the cosmos. God made the green grass. God made the birds of the air. He made all of these things. But Christ died for you. You are of value and of significance to God. We describe a God as best as we can with our limited knowledge and language. You know, the word I come back to so often is going to be we serve an awesome God. My cooking's not awesome. My artwork's not awesome. Oh, you did such an awesome job. That was an awesome play. You know what? There is nothing that is awesome when we compare it to how awesome God is. Creator God, sustainer God, eternally existent, that is the God that we serve. Let me encourage you in your vocabulary, in your language, in how you, how you uh, describe God. Let the word awesome become a part of your everyday vocabulary. The same God that created the heavens and the earth has created you. We sing a song here in church so very often. We're not going to do it today, but uh, I believe we did it last week or the week before. We sing the song, How Great Thou Art. You know, my prayer is this, uh, that you go home today and you're singing How Great Thou Art, and that that song has new meaning for you. Let it be more than just words on a page that were composed a long time ago. Realize for yourself the greatness of God and the fact that such a great God, such a a bigger God than you and I could ever even fathom. He is a great God and he loves you. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the love that you show to us each and every day, even as the psalmist David has, has written, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Father, there are so many times where, Lord, we want to construct ourselves bigger than what we are. And, and Lord... I am not the creator, I am not sustainer, I am not self-existent, I am not the eternal one. Those are attributes of you. Father, may it never be about how awesome we think we are, but rather how awesome we know that you are. And Father, may we give you praise, Father, for how you how you love us, how you show us that. I'm firmly convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt, Lord, one of the ways you show your love to us as your creation is by the beautiful tapestry that you paint around us every day. And Father, we are so quick to dismiss that. Father, I pray that we would take the time, Father, just to reject on your greatness in creation and Father, then to give you praise that even as you paint this beautiful tapestry, Father, you do it with us in mind. Father, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.